Hey kids, welcome back to Rob's Guide to Hearts of Iron 3. This episode we are going to be talking about the ever divisive Order of Battle, or OOB as it is known. Uh, the Order of Battle is, uh, is a feature that some people love and some people hate. Uh, it is certainly a lot of micromanagements and can be one of the more challenging aspects of the game. Uh, it is also, in my opinion, uh, a, a very, very complex and interesting and detailed and potentially immersive part of the game. I personally love the, the Order of Battle in Hearts of Iron 3. It is more complex and detailed than, than, than the Order of Battle in Hearts of Iron 4 and other games. Uh, so I'm a big fan of it. Uh, but it is one of the more challenging aspects of the game, so uh, we're, we're going to dive in and, and try and cover off uh, uh, some tips and strategies to um, manage it better and get the most out of this feature. So uh, we've started out as the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union has by far the largest, uh, the largest military in the game and will probably have the largest military throughout the game. Germany might give them a run for their money at some point. Uh, and so the, the Soviet Union starting out in 1936 is a very challenging order of battle to deal with. And so what better example to use? First of all, let's just talk about the, the general function of the order of battle. Uh, there's two, I would say there's two basic functions that the Order of Battle has in this game. First of all, it allows you to organize your army. So it allows you to attach your units to different points of the hierarchy so that you can find your units, issue them orders, potentially put them on AI control. Uh, how you organize your Order of Battle is m very much a matter of personal taste and, uh, and, you know, how you find it easiest to locate all of those divisions. You may end up having hundreds of divisions by the, by the end of the game. And so being able to find them easily is is going to make your game a lot easier. The other function of the Order of Battle uh, is that the various levels of the Order of Battle hierarchy give give bonuses, uh, substantial bonuses to your military. So, so understanding those bonuses and using them correctly will give you big boosts uh, to in in terms of the effectiveness of your of your army and air force and navy. All right, so uh, let's. There's a few different ways of viewing the order of battle. Uh, we can we can view it on the map by clicking uh, any one of these HQs. Uh, when we click these, we can see uh, we can see this, these blue lines heading down towards uh, lower levels of the hierarchy. Uh, we can see white lines and the skinny white lines at the bottom of the hierarchy. If, if we click something that's in the middle of the hierarchy, we will see a green line that shows uh, what what um, HQ it is attached to, and then blue lines or potentially white lines uh, showing uh, showing the lower levels of the, the hierarchy. If you see red lines like this, it means that the the HQs are out of range, uh, so so they're not they don't receive any of the bonuses if they are out of range. Uh, the other way to view the order of battle is the unit interface. So if I click this, I can see every unit that's attached to uh, every unit that's, that's attached to this HQ. This is a six. Uh, a, a, Six X's means that this is a theater HQ. If I if I select the Baltic Front, I can see these three armies here. I can select the Eighth Army. See, there's two corps attached to it. I can select the corps and see there's two divisions attached to the corps. Uh, and I can also click up on these and go back the other way. Uh, so that's one way to one one way to view the order of battle. I can also click this green bar to select every subordinate unit and their subordinate units attached to that HQ. So that's a very, very useful button. For example, if I want to select all the units on the Baltic Front, I, I first click the Baltic Front, then I click that green bar. Go back up to the theater here. Uh, I can also like select the air units that are attached there and everything like that. Very, very useful. The, the other way you can view the order battle is the outliner. So there are three outliners. There's the land unit outliner, the air unit outliner, and the naval unit outliner. Obviously there's all these, these combat, uh, these are like events uh, outliners. Uh, and you are able to use these, these uh, expands, these, these plus and minus buttons to expand various levels of the order of battle. Uh, one thing to note, very useful, uh, naval units and air units uh, in the naval and air outliner ta uh, sections here will show the number of units uh, in, in each stack. So the red banner Baltic fleet has 11 ships. 
This uh, Pacific fleet has five uh, has the five submarines attached to it. Uh, if we look at air and naval units here, we don't see the number of units. We see their strength. So it's very useful to have, even if you don't particularly want to attach your air and naval units to the to the land unit hierarchy. It's overall it's it's a it's a good idea to do so because you you'll have another way of viewing these units, and you can quickly scan if you have like five different air air units attached to uh, one HQ. You'll be able to quickly scan their health and and look at for units that are that are you know down in the 60 percent. 60% or whatever and then kind of evaluate those situations so it is a useful thing to know the the fourth way to view the uh, order of battle is the order of battle interface which you you click on a unit here in the outliner or on the map and you click these two arrows here and that's going to open up this view this view is is in probably in many ways the most useful way to view the order of battle we can do a lot of things here so we can expand the entire order of battle uh, we can collapse it. Uh, we can very easily see the leaders. Uh, we can very easily see which brigades are in the division. So it's giving you a huge, a really detailed overview of your entire army. So I can see, oh, what's going on here? I have three divisions that only have one brigade in them, which is a, uh, you know, something I'm going to want to want to fix as soon as possible, right? Uh, I can also drag and I can also drag units around the hierarchy in here. So let's find an example. Let's uh, let's just grab here. We go this this HQ for example. You can see these divisions are not attached to to any HQ. So I could drag this down and stick it in the army, or drag it back up. Uh, I can also I can also hit the theater forces button, which will attach any units to the theater that they're located in. You look at the theater map mode. Any units that fall within these color coded areas will will be attached to. If if you have unattached units, units that aren't aren't attached to a theater, this will this will attach it to the theater, and that's a great way to clean up your order of battle. Uh, you can also expand this, and this is particularly useful for for dragging units back and forth, right? So I can drag this unit here to this army. Oh, uh, it's you know like I can I can drag. I can drag the oh, this unit out of out of range. Okay, I'll drag it back here. Like this is a very useful a very useful interface. You can also like use these independently of one another, uh, and you can also match the view. So so that's really 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 useful. Uh, I I I this is even this is often overlooked uh, this whole interface, and it can save you a mountain of time in terms of managing your order of battle. So I would try and get uh, get accustomed to. Uh, all of these little features, like this one is really important. Uh, opening this up is really important. Understanding how the naval and air units appear here is really important as well. Very good thing to get used to, we just sort of play around in that interface. Um, in terms, uh, so let's, let's now talk about the different levels of the order of battle and what their functions are. Just open up a small HQ here with not too many units attached to it. So we'll look at it in this view because this is going to be the best view. Uh, so the top level of the order the, of the order of battle is the theater level of the order of battle, and we're actually looking at the theater map mode here. So each of these color coded areas correspond to theaters. There are nine theaters at the in the 1936 start for for the Soviet Union, uh, and theater theaters. The theater HQ unit has a radio range of of uh, 2,000 kilometers, which means units have to be 2,000 kilometers away in order to get any of the bonuses that the theater gives. Uh, if you want to get a sense, if you're planning out your theaters, you're planning out your order battle, and you want to get a sense of distances on the map, click on a province and hover over any other province and look in the bottom right corner with the yellow the yellow text in that little tooltip at the bottom right corner will tell you that this province here, which I cannot pronounce, is 1,108 1, kilometers from the other province we clicked on, right? Uh, you know, uh, Leningrad is... Leningrad is 585 kilometers from Moscow, right? And that's very that'll give you a very useful sense. And you can kind of want you can kind of just like hover this around and get a sense of you know distances on the map. It's going to be very useful, uh, very useful tip. 
So the theater HQ, uh, if it is in range, it gives a bonus to uh, stacking penalty. It reduces the stacking penalty um, uh, that units get. So it's not a particularly useful bonus. It's a bonus that is mostly useful in very large battles where you're wanting to throw more divisions than the f uh, into battle than the frontage will normally allow. And you'll be able to get away with that by having a very good theater leader. Uh, but it's one of the least less important bonuses overall. The theater also gives the leader the the leader uh, traits multiplied by the skill divided by 16. Don't worry too much about that math, but basically the theater uh, not only does it give the the stacking penalty reduction based on the leader's skill, so the higher the leader's skill, the more stacking penalty reduction you get, um, but it also gives the trait that that leader has so for example this logistics wizards trait uh, it would give that it would give that trait divided uh d divided by 16 depending on the skill as well so they don't give the the trait of the leader and and the skill of the leader is not going to trickle down to at to the division level uh that that much uh, because it's so far up the hierarchy Army groups. Army groups are a vital part of the uh, of of the order of battle. Uh, they are indicated by the five five X's, which you can see on the map here. Let's find one. There we go. You can see the five X's there. And uh, they in, in in the Soviet order of battle, the historical order of battle, the Soviet term for army groups was front. So this is the Baltic front, the Moscow front. Uh, that's that's the Soviet terminology. Uh, other other nations use other terminology. The army group has a range of uh, 600 kilometers. Uh, it it gives a bonus to supply consumption, so it reduces supply consumption based on the skill of the field marshal in charge. Uh, it also gives the, the traits, so this would be offensive doctrine, multiplied by the skill and then divided by eight. So once again, you're not getting too, too much of the trait bonus uh, at the division level because it's that far up the hierarchy. Uh, keep in mind though that both the theater and the army group, they, even though their trait bonus is going to be maybe less than 1%, uh, because it applies to so many units, it will have a substantial effect. Armies have a radio range of, of 400 kilometers. Uh, they, the army leader, based on their skill, gives a bonus to combat efficiency. So that's a very important bonus. Combat efficiency is basically a flat uh, percentage modifier to land combat. So very, very useful to keep in mind. Uh, they also give the, the traits bonus. So in this case, defensive doctrine uh, multiplied by the skill and then divided by four. So y you can see that, that the, they're not getting the full bonus of the division level, but they are getting one quarter of that. The divisions are getting one quarter of that bonus. So it starts to be pretty substantial. Uh, any unit that's, that is attached and in, in radio range is gonna get that bonus. The core level is the is the bottom of the is the lowest level of HQ units in Vanilla Hearts of Iron 3. Uh, it has a range of 200 kilometers, so it has to be much closer to its units to to give bonuses. Uh, the bonus that it gives is is um, reinforcement chance. Uh, I will I will look I will give you a detailed view of reinforcement chance in I believe the next episode in this series is going to be on land combat I know you've all been waiting for that uh, so I will I will demonstrate how reinforcement chance works in that episode but suffice to say for now that that reinforcement chance is very very important uh, if you have multiple divisions uh, in combat at the same time and some of them are in reserve reinforcement chance has to do with how quickly those units move in onto the front line it can make or break a battle like it can make the difference between losing a battle because all of the front line divisions retreated or winning a battle because all of a sudden a, an armored division joined the joined the fray and you know the cavalry arrives and changes the course of the battle so reinforcement chance is very 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 important core leader uh, and that's also the reinforcement chance is going to be multiplied by the leader's skill uh, the core leaders also uh, give the trait multiplied by the skill divided by two so uh, traits are very important at the core level leader traits and be because they're going to be distributed to all the units lower in the hierarchy keep in mind though that uh, 
Uh, something like a logistics wizard trait that's reducing supply is only going to reduce supply for the units that are below it on the hierarchy. So you're going to get much more out of those traits, uh, but you're not going to get... Um, you're not going to have as many units affected by them. A corps can contain five divisions. An army can contain five corps. Uh, an army group can, can contain uh, five armies. And a theater can contain as many subordinate subordinate units as it wants wants you can also attach uh, divisions to the directly to the theater level you can attach any any uh, lower level of the hierarchy to any higher level of the hierarchy uh, but theaters can have an unlimited number of units attached to them uh, and every other level of the hierarchy can only have five units attached to it uh, there is an exception made for air and naval units there you can attach an unlimited number of air and naval units to uh, to any level of the hierarchy. So core design, I would say that there are a few different t kinds of uh, a few different categories of cores. So this is what I would call an infantry core, and it's 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 probably the most common uh, the mo most common type of core. You can also only you don't need to attach don't feel obliged to attach five divisions to every core. It certainly is the most um, the most effective use of your HQ unit in a certain sense, but there are advantages to having fewer units uh, to a core. For example, if you attach four divisions to your core and they each have three brigades in them, then one core can, can be used in one province and without hitting a stacking penalty. So that is one strategy that people use to organize their cores so that they they can send an entire core into combat without worrying about a stacking penalty. Uh, three, three divisions, sorry, four divisions with three brigades or five divisions with two combat brigades will avoid the stacking penalty. So that is something you want to keep in mind with core design, but this is a basic um, infantry uh, core. The other type of core that I would categorize is a purely armored core. Uh, this, I mean, here we only have two armored divisions attached to the core, but we could attach five uh, armored divisions to uh, one core. And the advantage of a core like that is that it uh, is that the that whole core will move very quickly. Uh, and so it can, if you're if you're doing like a um, a big a very fast advance uh, behind enemy lines. Having a core that moves quickly and that's entirely dedicated to armored combat is a major advantage. Let's uh, let's just open the technology screen for a second. One thing, if you are going to field armored cores, it's going to be very important for you to tech up mobile warfare because mobile warfare is going to increase the speed of the HQ units. If you do not have uh, HQs that can at least almost keep up to your uh, armored cores, then you're going to have trouble fielding uh, functional armored cores because the armor will very quickly outrun the core. Armor can go 200 kilometers in, you know, a couple weeks or something, and then the core is left behind, and the core is moving really slowly, so you're going to either have to strategically redeploy the core to s speed things up, which consumes a lot of supply, or, or you're, you know, you're just going to have to, w the armor's going to have to stop and wait for the core to catch up. So armored cores are, are very, very powerful. Uh, most of the time in this game, you're going to keep your infantry and armor in separate cores. Uh, uh, there is, there, there is, however, a third category of core, which I would call the mixed core. A mixed core could look something like this: three infantry and one armor. It could also look something like this, with uh, three infantry and two armor. The function of a mixed core is to spread your armor evenly around your entire army. Uh, this is kind of a risky strategy because armor is best used uh, in in concentration, uh, generally speaking, especially in the long term as you develop kind of a more blitzkrieg approach to warfare. Uh, it does have a function, though. Uh, Certainly having armor spread evenly ac across your fronts uh, can mean that you have armor ready. Uh, it, it can make your line more solid. So if you're making a, a purely static defensive front line, then having a mixed core, I would this is this to me is 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 going to be not that effective because most armies are not going to have a you know two out of 
a two to three ratio of infantry to armor at the beginning of the game. So something like something like this is probably going to be more effective if you're going to do a mixed core. Th four infantry uh, divisions and one armored division. This might be a more effective type of core. Or maybe even uh, three infantry divisions and one armored core. Uh, the, our army division, sorry. That that could be a, that could be an effective core design. So that that's the mixed core. Not really something I advise to use very heavily, especially in the late war. Uh, I would advise uh, keeping your armored cores and infantry cores separate. Uh, there is a kind of fourth category of core, which I can't really show you here because we're playing as the Soviet Union. Uh, there are some specialized cores, uh, such as uh, Marine Corps, Marine Corps, uh, you may want to keep all, you know, you may want to build, say, four or five Marine divisions and put them into a core. Uh, and, and so the, you know, th those, those, it may be good to have s sort of specialized units uh, attached all to one core. You may also want to have a kind of amphibious core that has a mix of units. So maybe there's three marine divisions, one armored division, and one infantry division. That could be an interesting core where you put all of that core on one transport fleet. You land the marines first. Once the marines have grabbed a port, then you land the armored division and the infantry division, which will give you, you know, a little bit more flexibility. So if you want to sort of micromanage and create these kind of special forces cores with a mix of different types of divisions that's also an option uh, I tend to keep my infantry in 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 one core my armor in another core and uh, special forces in, in in completely dedicated cores one other one other um, situation I'm going to talk about with cores that 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 while we're while, while we're on the topic of cores is using cores as combat divisions it is possible to put uh, combat and support brigades into a core uh, and this does have its uses you know at the start of the game you'll be able to put up the three brigades add three brigades into a core uh, later on you'll be able to add the fifth brigade if you so choose there are a few pros and cons to the to using cores as divisions let's start with the pros um, First of all, it saves on leaders. If you are a country that does not have enough leaders, so the Soviet Union actually starts out without enough leaders, um, then then putting uh, brigades, putting combat brigades in your cores and using them as combat divisions uh, is is useful. Uh, so it saves on leaders. Also, if you're a country that does not have very many, even if you have a lot of leaders, but you don't have a lot of very good leaders, having less overall divisions uh, and putting those leaders at the core level and using those cores as combat divisions can be uh, advantageous. The other advantage is that leaders level up faster if because because the leaders at the core level, army level, army group level, and theater level do gain experience from combat from their subordinate units. So the theater leader, the, the field marshal at the theater level is going to get a tiny bit of experience every time one of the divisions it, that's attached to it gets into combat. But you, you get le the higher up the hierarchy you are, the less experienced leaders get. Uh, however, when the core is actually directly in battle, uh, those leaders uh, will are going to level up a lot faster. So if you have some particularly good leaders at the so for example, if I put like uh, you know Zukov or or you, you know uh, uh, Montgomery or one of those you know one of those all-star generals at the core level, I, I might be able to get them up to level seven, eight, nine a lot faster uh, by having them at the core level and by having them actually in combat. The third advantage to using cores as divisions is that the leaders are more likely to take control of the battle. So in a land battle, and I'll go into more detail during the land combat episode, in a land battle, uh, typically the le the highest uh, rated leader that's in the battle uh, will will take control of the battle and give give a combat bonus to all of the divisions and and so if you have something like four or five divisions in battle the best divisional leader is going to take control of the battle uh, if the core is actually in the battle then it's a lot more likely that the core leader is going to take control of the battle and so if your core leaders are generally higher skill level and have better traits than your than your division level 
world leaders, then then you you know you will you you may end up having better leaders taking direct control of of individual battles. So those are those are some of the pros of using cores as combat uh, units. The cons. Uh, this is a poor combat unit. The HQ has poor combat stats, so uh, you know, and there's fewer ava available brigade slots. So it's going to tend to be a lower strength unit with less combined arms and. Uh, and, you know, overall not a very strong combat units. Uh, I also find that using cores as divisions leads to a lot of micromanagement in the production interface because you are probably going to have to build a whole, either a whole bunch of extra divisions and then manually mix them into the cores or a whole bunch of individual brigades and then manually mix them into, into the cores. So I find that it adds a level of micromanagement that usually isn't worth it. The third problem, and this is this to me is actually the biggest issue with using cores as combat divisions. The third problem is that it creates a very inflexible order of battle. Generally speaking, in this game, you are going to redesign your order of battle. You're going to shift around um, units from one core to another, cores from one army to another. Uh, you're going to do that. You can you know you can do that by using these shortcuts, using these these buttons here or the appropriate shortcuts by detaching them from the hierarchy and reattaching them to to other armies. Uh, you know you're going to be doing that a lot. You're you're also going to be deleting HQ units, creating new HQ units. So if you have uh, combat brigades sprinkled around your HQ units, uh, then it, you know you, those those HQs are going to be kind of bogged down by those brigades. You're going to have to if you if you do want to delete those cores, you're going to have to first detach the infantry, uh, the infantry or other brigades that are attached to them. Uh, if you want to change the composition of those cores, you may have to move that unit around the map. Uh, it's it's really you know so sometimes you you're going to have a lot more cores on the map. Sometimes you're going to delete cores. It just makes your whole order of battle le less flexible and less dynamic. So I would do it sparingly. There are a few examples where I think it's a really good idea. Uh, and uh, for example, the when I build marine cores, if I am going to build a marine core as a country that's going to do a lot of amphibious landings, I tend to put marine brigades at the core level because it allows the core to uh, disembark from the transports a lot faster. I typically want my Marines to stay in range of their core HQ, so being able to land the core HQ very quickly. HQs have a very a, 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 a pretty severe amphibious penalty, uh, and that that penalty will be reduced by having amphibious by having Marine brigades attached at the core level. So that's one example where I almost always put brigades at the core level. Uh, but but generally speaking, I would I would do I would use it fairly sparingly otherwise, and I would never put, you're able to do this, but I would never put brigades into an army uh, HQ, and I would, I would basically never put them at army group or, or theater level. It, you know, sometimes I will mix, um, I will mix garrison brigades into a theater level HQ. One example of that would be Leningrad here. I might take this garrison and mix it into the army group or the theater here. Uh, and that just gets rid of a garrison unit. It means I don't have to use up a leader for that garrison units. And uh, this is fine. This this garrison units don't tend to see a lot of combat anyway. I'm probably going to want a garrison unit in this port. I'm probably fine with this HQ not moving. That this means if I put it, I would probably use the theater HQ rather than the army group HQ because I'm more likely to need to move that army army group HQ around the map. But if I move the theater HQ over here and I mix in those garrison units, then it it saves gives me a leader and you know having garrisons attached to to the theater HQ technically it's going to make a less uh, 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 it's going to it's going to dilute the defensive bonuses that the garrisons get but at the end of the day I don't use I don't really use garrisons as combat divisions I use them to to dissuade the enemy from launching amphibious invasions and then I use them to to uh, you know temporarily hold the fort until reinforcements arrive so having garrisons attached to an HQ that is going to be static on the map generally a theater HQ not a bad idea uh, another thing to note is that if you are going to use cores as divisions, uh, if you know if you have a an armored or a motorized core, the core is going to need to have armored and motorized uh, brigades attached to it. If you are going to have uh, motorized divisions that you know, so you, they're not like 
infantry divisions, their motorized infantry divisions, then you should keep them in separate corps from your regular infantry, uh, generally speaking, for the same reasons as armor. They're they're going to uh, move, you know, move, you want to keep the corps moving at the same speed as the subordinate divisions. If we pretend that uh, these two infantry divisions are motorized divisions, uh, mixing, you know, motorized and armored divisions into the same corps is not that bad an idea. Certainly, I like to have, you know, if I have enough armored units, I, I tend to like to have, uh, as soon as my army starts to get bigger and I expand my armored, the armored components of my army, I would, I like to separate out my, my uh, armored and motorized or mechanized uh, divisions into separate cores. Uh, but uh, it's not a bad, the, this is not a bad uh, mixed mixed division. You could even do uh, three or four motorized three or four motorized infantry with one armored division. That could be not a bad uh, not a bad core design as well. The 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 disadvantages of the mixed core are going to be reduced by the. Uh, by reduced if you have a motorized mixed core. So that covers off core design. Army design, some of the same principles that, uh, apply to core design. In the early game, you are unlikely to have enough um, armored divisions to create an entire armored army. Uh, once you get, you know, if you have like 30, 40, 50 armored divisions at some point, and as the Soviets, this is entirely possible and and probable and even probably a good idea uh, it may be you know in the early game you may want to design armies uh, with say uh, two or three or four infantry corps and one or two armored corps right so that would be kind of a mixed uh, a mixed army uh, in the same way that uh, you know that we talked about mixed cores uh, later on as you get more and more armored divisions you may want to start grouping your armored divisions and your armored cores into completely armored armies you may also want to create motorized armies with three motorized cores two motor uh, two armored cores for example so you may want to have an entire army that's that is motorized and armored and or armored uh, at some point. You probably will not be able to field an entirely armored army in 1936. Even as the Soviet Union, you probably won't, it probably won't be advantageous to field an entirely armored army when the war opens. And the reason for that is that you're going to need, if I look at the terrain map here, I'm going to need armor down here. I'm probably going to need a little bit of armor up here. I may need to have one or two divisions of armor on, on other fronts as well. Uh, so so you're going to need to spread your armor across your front, and the most effective way to do that is probably going to be to attach uh, armored cores to uh, e armies that are otherwise based around infantry, uh, and so to create kind of mixed mixed armies in that sense. Uh, as you get more and more armored divisions, as the proportion of armored divisions in your army increases, or as the total number of armored divisions increases as your armor practical gets better and you're able to churn out those divisions really quickly, uh, it will quickly become advantageous to build entirely motorized and or armored armies. If you want to do an encirclement that looks something like this, you're going to, you know, something like this, <laughs> this, is, this is a very grand encirclement, you're going to probably need an entirely motorized army to, to complete at least one leg of this, right? Uh, and an, an army with mixed armor and infantry is going to is going to have a, a severe disadvantage of having to wait for uh, wait for the infantry to catch up. So it is entirely useful to have um, armored armies later in the game. There's a couple of other types of armies that I would mention. Um, it, it, there are many situations where it is useful to use what you know. We talked about using cores as division, the sort of divisions as combat divisions. It can also be useful to use armies as cores. So if I look at these fronts here, they have uh, very large provinces. Over here, the provinces are even larger, and out in the in the east here, these provinces are huge, right? So it's unlikely that like the just two provinces away is out of range of a core HQ. So from this province to this province, it's out of range. So in these situations, you're not going to have cores. You're typically not going to have very many, uh, very many divisions in any 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 one province. And so it's not worth it having cores. So you're going to attach the divisions directly to the army level, which means you're only going to be able to have five divisions per army. 
the other thing about uh, the other thing about these kind of remote situations uh, is that your units are, are it's very unlikely that you'll have more than two or maximum three divisions fighting in any battle at any given time so the reinforcement chance bonus of the core is not all that important so in these remote situations you're not going to have cores at all you're going to use your armies in lieu of cores Another situation that might be useful for armies is uh, you, is creating an airborne army because uh, that because supply planes have quite a long range. If you are going to do uh, an airborne invasion behind enemy lines, you cannot drop cores out of uh, transport planes. So, so having an army that's on the front line that is your airborne army, and then dropping the the uh, airborne uh, forces behind enemy lions and having them still be within range of the army, getting the combat efficiency bonus from the army and getting getting you know any of the trait bonuses that the army gives as well is worthwhile. So if you are going to use paratroopers, I would consider attaching them to a separate airborne army. Let's talk about uh, army group designs now. Uh, I would say there are basically two types of army group designs. First of all, you're typically going to uh, design your army groups around covering a certain area of the front. So obviously army groups have a range of 600. If we take, let's take this province here of King Zepp. I don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, technically an army group could cover, you know, Basically, the entire, you know, this this whole Western Front of the Soviet Union could have two army groups. However, you're not necessarily going to be using different sections of the front for the same purpose. So, for example, uh, you might want to have one army group that's on the Romanian border, one army group that's on the Polish border south of these marshes, one army group that's on the Polish border here, one army group that covers off the Baltic nations. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you use those specific parameters, but uh, basically, you don't always use the range to determine how far, uh, how you know what, how you're going to design your army groups. I would des I, so for example, you know, if I was going to have units on the Turkish front and the Persian front, it's probably useful to have a separate army group for both of those fronts. The other thing that I would note about army groups is the army group is the best level to attach air and naval units. Now obviously naval units have a fairly far range. If I take out these um, submarines, it'll have like a four, you know, a 2000 kilometer range, the, you know, those aircraft um, those aircraft carrier task forces have like kind of have a range of like 4,000 kilometers, so they're going to be out of range of the army group. So it's kind of there's no point really attaching them to the army group. But if you're using naval forces close to the port where they're based, then they are going to get and this supply bonus from being attached to the the army group level. Uh, and the same goes for air units. They're going to get the uh, the the supply uh, bonus from being attached to the army group level. Um, you can you can attach air and naval units further down uh, the hierarchy. So you may want to attach your your landing craft fleets to the uh, to the core level if you are fielding a, a marine corps. That could be an interesting design. Uh, you might want to attach your uh, transport planes and or and or any planes that are going to be defending those transport planes to the airborne army. If you created an airborne army, then you might want to do that as well. That could be an interesting choice. You may also wish to create army groups that are dedicated naval and or air force HQs that only have air or naval units attached to them. Uh, and that can be very, very useful, especially when you're playing as a country with a huge navy like the United Kingdom. I will often create a home fleet uh, army group level HQ and just have only naval units attached to that, possibly a mix of naval units and naval bombers, possibly even a mix of air units and naval bombers where I'm having air units that are supposed to be defending the fleets from naval bombers. Uh, that could be a good thing to do, very useful, especially if you're going to use AI control for your navy at some point. Uh, and the same goes for uh, air HQs. Uh, you may wish to create an air HQ with units attached to it in case you want to automate those uh, those that that part of your air force. So, uh, so you know those are two types of of army groups. Maybe the, the sort of taking a section of your fronts. Uh, that was going to have specific uh, defensive or offensive objectives, uh, or taking uh, or or designing them with air and naval units in mind. Uh, theater design, we can look at the theater map mode here. Uh, 
Uh, so there's there are a couple of factors to take into consideration when doing theater design. Obviously, the range is a big one. So we can see that this this um, this far eastern theater, for example, it's actually more than two two thousand kilometers wide. So if I was going to field units on this border, if I was going to field units all along this border, I would technically need two theaters for all those units to be in range. Unless the theater was the theater HQ is right in the middle, then I might be able to stretch it all the way over to the ed to the very limits of of the 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 theater here. So theaters have a range. This is not technically it's not too big if the theater HQ is located right in the middle of it. But if the theater is sort of off to one side or perhaps in a port province or something, then it's not it's it's not going to be a range. So that's one thing you keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is well. You know why does the Soviet Union? If you only, you know, if we can cover this entire front with one theater, so why does the Soviet Union have nine theaters at the start of the game? Specifically, why does it have one, two, three, four, five, six theaters, uh, seven theaters just on this western front? Well, the AI is this is designed for the AI. So when the A, when when the Soviet Union is played uh, is being played by the AI. Uh, the AI is not very good at allocating forces between different theaters unless that theater has a pretty short front. It's not good at managing a huge long front and moving units. Uh, the, the, the AI is very bad at keeping HQs in range of one another. They will also, if you allow them to create or disband HQs, uh, they will typically create far too many HQs. Uh, it's just, it's an unholy mess. The shorter a front you give them to manage, the better it is. The AI is fairly good at, at doing certain types of combat. And I'm going to do a whole video on using AI control to kind of, you know, not have to micromanage every, uh, every aspect of your army. AI control is very powerful in this game. But if you are going to use it, then I would keep in mind that you're going to want, you're not going to want to use too minimalistic an approach of uh, your theater design. Uh, I would keep that in mind. Put aside the AI control aspect of theater design for now. And let's think about uh, how we would redesign these, these theaters here. I would tend to get rid of some of these theaters because they're not really necessary. What I would probably do here is I would create separate theaters for every, every kind of major front in the war. Uh, so we could probably have one theater. Let's take the Stavka HQ here. We could probably have one theater for all this. Right, so I, I, in order, if I want to redesign my theaters, I click the Edit Theater button here, and I drag here. Uh, you're unable to delete the theater HQs until you've gotten rid of every province that's assigned to them, so it can be a little bit time-consuming. Um, but yeah, so let's let's get rid of all these ones. We'll get rid of that'll get rid of I think four H four theater HQs that we just don't need. You can, if you hover, if you want to double, if you see like two colors that are similar like this, hover over the province, look in the bottom right corner, it'll tell you which, uh, so this one's Bryansk, this one's Stalingrad. Right, there we go. can select all these. And there we go. So that, that, this theater here could be our main kind of Soviet Western Front theater. Uh, I would then, I don't think we need two separate theaters here. So I would take the Leningrad HQ here and I would probably attach all this to it. Every country is going to have different needs in terms of theaters and how you do this is very much a matter of preference. If you want to use a lot of AI control, you are going to have to design smaller theaters probably than this. Uh, but you can use AI control at the army group level and that could that could be a decent way to do things as well. So there's, there's one approach. Uh, we did that. The other two theaters, I would probably leave them as is. This is probably fine. So we've gone down to one, two. Oh, we missed some spots up here. We've gone down from nine. We've gone down to one, two, three, four theaters, which is which is probably going to be a lot more useful, considering that we can have an unlimited number attached to a, a number of units attached to these theaters. I'm gonna I'm gonna highlight a third option here. Uh, you may wish to create a purely defensive 
a purely defensive theater. And this is going to be especially useful for countries like Germany and perhaps the UK that are going to have to have air units, uh, air units kind of on permanent patrol. Uh, and so, and, and things like partisan suppression in conquered countries. So as Germany, when I conquer France, maybe I just create a theater for France. I assign some cavalry units to do partisan suppression, some garrison units to uh, defend the ports, and then maybe I just put that whole theater on AI control, give it a few air units so it can defend against bombing, and then I go focus on the Eastern Front. So you may wish to create, uh, y even as the Soviet Union, maybe maybe I take one of these uh, theaters here, I create like a frontline theater like that, and I keep all of this on AI control, and I attach a couple air units to it, and I just let let that, let this this sort of reserve theater be a purely defensive theater. That's another uh, useful useful type of theater to do. Uh, one thing I want to highlight with the uh, edit theater is that if you if you are one of the countries that has uh, provinces uh, near the international dateline in the Pacific Ocean, then uh, oops, don't want to do anything there. Then you it, you'll notice that this this is there's kind of a glitch here. So if you're trying to uh, if you're trying to take these islands and give them to a theater, zoom right in. Just zoom right in on those particular islands and do that. Otherwise, it, you, you'll it'll get all buggy and weird, and you can make a big mess. One more point on uh, theaters: uh, any land that you take from the enemy will be attached to the theater to which the division is attached. So, if this division takes that province, that province will become part of this theater, uh, and that's a somewhat important thing to remember. If you're playing as, for example, the United Kingdom, uh, you can see the United Kingdom also has all these crazy theaters all over the place. Uh, for example, uh, if, if I'm planning on invasion, invading Persia, maybe I want Persia to be part of the Middle East theater. So I might want to do something like if I'm going to invade from the from from India here, maybe I want to put these provinces and attach them to the Middle East theater so that so that Persia becomes part of the Middle East theater. And that will apply as well if you're puppeting nations. It's not it's not a big deal, but if you are going to be doing things like putting a theater on AI control because you're not fighting in that region and you're just doing partisan suppression, then having that region be part of the right theater is not a bad idea. So I this is something that I often do as as the UK. I'll probably do something like this. Uh, even like that, where if I'm going to invade countries in this region, I want them, I want the adjacent provinces to be part of the theater that I want those countries to be part of after. So that's one thing to keep in mind. If you're playing, say, as the United States or the United Kingdom, and you're going to do a, you know, trans-oceanic invasion, so maybe you're invading Japan, or maybe you are doing a D-Day style invasion of Nazi-occupied Europe, uh, as the U U.S., for example, you may wish to create a theater HQ unit that has all of the invasion force attached to it and then once you've invaded drop that theater HQ and cre and then you're actually creating a new theater uh, a brand new theater in the in this continent that you've just invaded so you know if I was playing as the USA I would probably move my I would I would have one or two theaters for the USA and then I would create an overseas theater that I would bring over to England and then I would do the invasion and and then the occupied Europe would be part of the you know that new theater so that 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 doesn't end up attached to the USA you can also just create it once you've actually deployed your units but it's you know it's not a bad idea to create uh, an independent theater HQ that that will ship with your your uh, invasion force okay so I've gone over uh, most of the basics uh, around the the kind of mechanics of the order of battle uh, let's now put this into practice so I'm not going to move any of these move units around the map. I'm just going to leave them where they are for the purpose of demonstration. Uh, one thing uh, that some of you may want to do, and this is a fairly popular strategy for a peacetime order of battle, um, there's two things you should keep in mind. HQ units, uh, they're not only part of the organizational structure of your army, but they also consume supplies, which we can see up here, uh, and they also take. Uh, they also count as regular brigades, so they consume. They they use up consumer goods. 
So we, as the Soviet Union, we start as with 175 regular brigades, uh, almost half of which are HQ brigades, and that you know that means that our needs in terms of consumer goods are 34.92, which is a huge amount of your IC. So part of your goals in the early stage of the war is to is to pare down the number of HQ units you have to the strict minimum, uh, and there's a few different ways you can do this. Um, one strategy is to delete every single HQ on the map, uh, possibly even including the theater HQ. So you would get rid of all these theaters and only have one theater and delete all the HQ units. And then you relocate all of your units to the capital and that's going to reduce the supply consumption of all the units because supply flows outward from the capital. I'm not going to do that here, but it's certainly a strategy. If you wanted to do that, uh, what I would advise you to do is, is it would be to start out by deleting all the HQ units and then make everything one theater. Uh, click the click the theater forces button so that every single division in the game is all under one theater and then just strategically redeploy them to the capital. In the case of the Soviet Union, this would probably take you, this this may very well take, um, you know, six months just to move all those units. So, uh, you know, definitely, definitely something you want to plan in advance if you're going to do that, but it will save you, the savings are worth it. Uh, you will, right now this number is incorrect because it hasn't updated yet, but you, you will likely have next to no supply needs if all of your units are by the capital. It's, it, it, it verges on, on the kind of exploit category though especially for the Soviet Union and stuff like that. Uh, and there are advantages to distributing your units along the front as well. But it's something I want I should uh, something you should keep in mind is that that is a good strategy um, kind of relocating everything to the capital. So let's start uh, let's start organizing this uh, this order of battle though. Um, so we're going to try and delete as many HQs as we as we can. Uh, I am also I am going to delete all of the HQ units. Some of you may wish to keep the historical HQ units for historical flavor and things like that. And and, and you know I certainly do that sometimes. I, it can be an interesting way to play the game. Uh, you might want to use the historical naming schemes for the divisions and corps and and armies and army groups and all that. And that's that's very cool. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, I am going to just delete them all. Uh, deleting HQ units, we, you will have to um, put some IC into reinforcements to reinforce the new HQ units when you create new ones, but overall it is entirely worth it to reduce the supply consumption and the consumer goods consumption of, of all your HQ brigades. I would never really worry about deleting HQ brigades. The cost in terms of reinforcement is pretty marginal. If you app, if you if you really are concerned about it, then select all your HQ units and you can turn off um, you can turn off reinforcements uh, if you wish, uh, and that way IC won't be going into reinforcing HQ brigades, and then just remember to turn it back on when the war starts. I wouldn't bother. That's a real min maxi strategy. So let's just go through this one theater at a time. We're going to keep this theater. We'll keep Stavka. We'll keep the Far Eastern Theater. This theater is going to be deleted, so we can disband it because we do, it, doesn't, it doesn't have any territory anymore. Uh, we're going to go now down to the... Leningrad HQ we're keeping, Smolensk HQ is gone, the Bryansk HQ is gone, the Kiev HQ is gone, Odessa, and Stalingrad we're keeping. Yeah, we're keeping Stalingrad. Okay, now this has created a, a pretty, pretty unholy mess here, right? So select any theater units, or any unit at all on the map actually, and press the theater forces button, and now all of the subordinate units have been reattached to the theaters in which, they, they're, in which their territory is. So Stavka, Far Eastern Theater, we can see that actually, as I mentioned, some of these units are actually out of range of the, of the theater because the theater is, is very big. The Leningrad HQ and the Stalingrad HQ. Okay, and this is a pretty good setup for the Soviet Union. I'm not necessarily saying this is exactly how you should proceed for the Soviet Union, but I'm going to try and give you some tips. So uh, I would, my next step would be to select the theater and then click the green bar here. You can also see that there's 263,000 troops attached to this to this theater. Interesting to have that number. Uh, let's let's select all of that. And now what we're going to do is there's and there's two ways of doing this. We're going to only select the HQ units so that we don't delete any divisions. Now there's two ways to do this. There's the kind of sub subtraction method, where you you deselect any units that you don't want to delete, like this. And I find this is a fairly precise way to do things. We can also manually select all of the HQ units by holding down Shift. Uh, I find this one is a little bit more prone to error. Um, 
but you know it's up to you it also depends uh, how many HQ units there are some you'll find that some of the historical uh, orders of battle will have like you know 20 HQs and nine units or something and and so it's actually faster to uh, use these the subtraction method but I mean it, it, you know either way this you know either method you want to use is, is goods uh, just make sure you keep holding down the shift button. If you let go of it by accident, you'll you'll sort of screw things up. Okay, so I've I've got now 61 land units selected. I'm going to scroll up through this slowly and just make sure that, make absolutely sure that there are no uh, that there are no um, combat divisions, no divisions in this. Um, also, uh, you might want to double check and make sure there are a few orders of battle that start with um, things like garrison units in, in HQ brigades. I think Germany has a couple of those, or you know that they, there are there are um, HQ units in the in the in the game that do have combat brigades in them, but there are very few. At the start of the in the nineteen uh, in the in the 1936 start. So um, keep in mind if you if you try and delete this theater, it's not going to it's not going to de delete because it has territory. So I can I can either deselect it by pressing the X button there or just press the delete button here. Okay, now we've got the messy outliner and order of battle screen again. Even if we look in this screen here, we can see that it's as soon as it refreshes, it's like a total nightmare. Uh, so once again, we're going to hit the Theater Forces button, and now we can see that all those divisions are now directly attached to the theater. Let's do that for the other theaters. Shouldn't take too long. These ones are much smaller. If you accidentally uh, let go of the Shift button and you end up with like five HQ selected, just delete them, Theater Forces again, and do it again. That's That trick works perfectly fine. I'll, I'll show you that. I'll demonstrate it here in the uh, in the Stalingrad HQ. So let's say I'm holding down Shift to go click, 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 and oops, I let go of the Shift button. Fine, I can delete these. Theater Forces, click the green bar and just start again. And it's fine. You haven't, uh, you know, you haven't really lost any progress. Uh, one thing to notice, uh, for the Soviets, the Far Eastern Theater is all regular divisions, and I'll talk a little bit more about that after. Uh, I'm trying to avoid turning this into a Soviet strategy guide, to be honest. Uh, uh, you know, I would certainly be happy. I, I would love to do a Soviet Let's Play at some point. Uh, it's one of my favorite countries to play. But, uh, you know, there are a few tips uh, I can give you about these units over here. Let's delete these. Uh, hit Theater Units again. Theater Forces again. Hit the green bar. Scroll down, double check that there's no more HQ units there. Everything is now attached to the theater level. So if you are playing as the Soviet Union, I would highly advise, uh, you can maybe leave the theater unit in the east here, but I would highly advise taking all these regular divisions and moving and actually moving them to the, to the Leningrad HQ, to this front with Finland because you're going to you're going to have the Finnish winter war. So this is just a Soviet tip. Uh, moving all those regular brigade divisions there will mean that you will not have to mobilize your army before you declare war on Finland. You can when you declare war, the army will automatically mobilize. You won't have to wait for those divisions to reinforce. Let's start reorganizing these um, these theaters. Uh, one one good tip uh, starting out um, especially if you have limited leaders during peacetime, you're going to want to limit supply consumption. So let's let's take go into the leader view here. I'm, I'm going to talk about leaders in, in the next episode. I've decided to make a separate episode for it because it'll just be better. Uh, so let's 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 start by finding all of our logistics wizards. We only have we don't have that many. Actually, let's hit unassign all. I'm going to unassign all leaders. You don't necessarily want to do that, but I I prefer to do it the first time around anyway. There we go. Now we can see all of our uh, all of our supply leaders. I'm actually going to just get rid of all the ranks so that they're all one-star generals. Just makes it easier, I find, to have every, everything be the same rank. Let's sort them by skill. And well, why don't we start by putting uh, high-level logistics wizard leaders at the theater level. That's going to reduce the supply consumption of every unit attached to the theater, which is going to give you a, a major bo boost to IC because you won't need to produce as many supplies. So Stavka has the most divisions. We'll give it a level, the level 4 guy, and then these guys will get level 3 guys. Our goals in the pre-war period are going to be to create a, 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 an efficient order of battle with as few HQ units as possible. Now, if I look up here, uh, I could create perhaps an army here. If I wanted to, I could create an army 
for these four divisions. Uh, but I prob I think it's probably not worth it. I think these four divisions can probably stay attached to the theater. They're they're unlikely to see very much combat. They're mostly just there to kind of hold the hold the borders against uh, Finland when we when we invade Finland. So I'll probably leave that at that. Um, these units here, uh, I these units here could be attached to uh, a core for sure. In fact, I'll, I would probably make a core here. Uh, now that's a core with only two divisions, so it's not ideal. Um, you probably want to put more divisions up here anyway. So for the time being, we'll just leave that as it is. Here we have uh, we have five. We have five divisions. One of them is a garrison division, though. So I'm not going to attach garrisons to. Uh, I would never attach a garrison to a core or or anything. They garrisons consume very few supplies. They don't enter combat very often. And if if the other units that are attached to the core are going to move around, then it's just not worth it. Uh, you might want to attach them to an army group or an army, but I wouldn't bother. It's just not worth it unless you want to clean up your order of battle, like visually in the outliner, and you want to create like maybe armies for Garrett for port garrisons or something, uh, then then by all means. I'm also not going to focus too much on the core design right now. I'm mostly just going to create my cores and my armies, and, and we can shift units around afterwards. So we'll make a core there. Uh, we're going to have a few extra units. If we want to take a look at uh, what we haven't done yet, we've got, we've got a, a bunch of divisions here that are not in cores, so that one's fine, that one's fine, that one's fine, that one's fine for now, uh, that one's fine. So we've got one, two, three kind of spare divisions here. Let's just, we can make a core here by clicking this button. And we can also, if we want to use the hotkeys, we can hit D to detach and attach it to a core either there. Attach this one to a core there. Uh, in this interface here, it'll, it'll show you the closest one. We could make an army out of these three uh, these three cores. It might be a bit risky to have one army for these three cores because this core is up here, and if this core is going to be advancing over here, it might get out of range of the army. But for the time being, during peacetime, I'll make uh, I'll make an, uh, a single army. I can drag down here and attach the cores to the army, and I'll make an army group. Why don't we use the Soviet uh, terminology? We'll call this the Leningrad Front. I would probably move move these divisions to other areas. Some of these divisions that are up here, I would leave these three infantry ones. I would probably take that armor and bring it down here. Uh, I, I might actually redistribute these forces elsewhere uh, to another theater as well, but I'm not going to focus too much on that. Right, let's look now at the more complex front here. There's a lot of divisions here. Uh, we, there's, we can look at, let's, let's, before we start assigning divisions to cores, let's just take a quick look at the, the nature of this front. So the, the defining feature of this front, I would say, is the marshes here. Uh, this is a major, major boundary, and you're probably going to want to have one army group on either side of that at the bare minimum, um, if not, uh, if not more than one army group on each side. So we can start maybe by making a core here. Oh, we have too many units. So let's just grab these three, make a core, and then we'll attach a couple of these manually to that core. Okay, and then we're going to have some units that are unattached here. Create a core there. These ones can be attached to that core. You can see here that the other cores here that are way up there you can are also an option, but you want to attach it to the closest core. And I think there's more space in that core. There we go. We create a core back here. There's five units there. I like to create all my cores, then create my armies. I find that to be an effective approach. So you can see for the time being, I'm actually making these mixed cores as well. We've got some units that are kind of um, back here as well, these sort of reserve divisions that aren't attached to cores. So we'll make a core there. Uh, these units here, I'll probably leave it attached directly to the theater, uh, and they can be sent out to other cores later. Now we've got much more units down here, so I'm just going to try and select five at a time. If we, uh, you know, if you if you don't get it right the first time, there's ways that you're going to be able to reorganize things later, so uh, don't worry too much about that. So I'm, you can see I'm creating some cores here that uh, that are not really perfectly designed. They're, they're mixed with different kinds of units. They might not even all be in range. It's not a big deal. There's a core we can create right there. Uh, this one's a bit weird because there's... Units are kind of spread out. I think that's pretty much it. Oh, we got these two, these four here. 
So we can see now that it looks to me like every I don't see any divisions that aren't attached to a core. Sometimes this visual um, this visual view is going to give you the best uh, the best uh, kind of preview. You can also look here. Let's open up the Stavka HQ here. We can see that pretty much everything we've got one, two, three. Those oh, there's one there that's not attached. Let's attach it to the closest core. And now let's start uh, sorting these cores into armies. So let's start with one of these cores uh, down here. We'll make an army. Just make sure that they're all kind of roughly in the same area. We can reorganize this after. Yeah, it's, it's getting a bit messy, but that's not a big deal. Do the same thing here. If I want to do this a bit faster, I could also open this, this view up here. Pick this core, attach it to that army. This core. This core is, is, is actually down here. Uh, below the marshes, so I'll create a separate army. Uh, we can probably also, the second and third army, we can make an army group. Uh, let's call this the, I don't know, Baltic Front. Uh, yeah, we'll call our Polish Front, let's call it. Why not? Uh, just for flavor and fun. Uh, and then this one will attach to that front as well. Still fairly messy, you can see, but we'll sort that out after. So this can be attached to the 4th army, and looks like we're good. Uh, let's now take the... Let's now take the 4th, 5th, and 6th armies and put them into an army group. We'll call this the uh, Ukrainian Front, and we'll attach uh, the 4th, 5th, and 6th army to it. It's a bit of a mess right now, but we'll sort it out after. In terms of the Far Eastern Theater, it's going to be a little bit different. So. I would probably do what I suggested, which is take these garrison brigades and just stick them in the theater. If you're going to leave the theater there, I would like to. I like to do that. You don't have to. And I'll just take this uh, this very useful artillery brigade and stick it into the uh, nearby uh, nearby infantry division. Uh, let's make a core here. Uh, these provinces are small. Let's make another core here. Now for these provinces, these provinces are far, are way too far apart to be attached to uh, to be attached at the core level. So there's a couple of options. We can leave them attached directly to the theater level, which is a fairly decent option, or we can create an army. Uh, I'm going to show you the army option. So maybe we'll make one of those armies. Uh, so we're going to create a core, which we're not going to use. We're going to create an army because you can see the core is at a range, right? Uh, now we're going to select the army. We're going to select all these units and we're going to delete that core and then we'll just manually reattach these to that army 7th army or yes yeah, the 7th army yeah you can see that even the army is out of range of that division there so you'd need to move this army over there you need to move the division there or actually spawn it here by by uh, we can actually let's fix it uh, one way we can fix it without having to move the unit is to just do this Delete the core, and then reassign these units to the Seventh Army. So I probably wouldn't bother with the rest of these units. I would just leave them attached directly to the uh, directly to the theater HQ later. As we move them into the position where we actually want them along the front, then we could potentially assign them to armies or or otherwise. Let's take the two cores we made down here. I believe they're there. There we go. 25th and 24th Corps. Let's make an army, and we might as well make an army group down here. And we'll call this the Far Eastern Front. Uh, prob I would probably not bother attaching that army to it. Maybe it's in range. Let's find out. Oh, it's in range for now. So there we go. We can even attach that army to it. There we go. So that's the Far Eastern Front. Uh, these, these could potentially be organized into armies, as I mentioned, but we'll leave them as they are for now. No need to make things over complicated. For this theater, uh, I, my advice would be to actually not assign any of these units to to any cores or anything like that. There's a few reasons for that. First of all, uh, this these this theater 
um, borders three countries that have very weak armies overall, Turkey, Persia, and Afghanistan. The combat, the combat benefits that we get from all the modifiers from having all those HQ units are not that worthwhile. We don't have many divisions on, on this. Uh, we don't have very many divisions on, on this front. So uh, there's not a, a huge amount of supply consumption. Uh, none of the divisions are regular, you know, like it's, 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 there's not much, uh, you know, we have this garrison division up in Stalingrad here. Uh, I would probably redistribute this to another theater. There's absolutely no point in having a garrison in Stalingrad. I mean, I know historically that there was a big battle in Stalingrad, but in most campaigns there will not be, especially if you are playing as the Soviet Union. Right, so we've done the first round of organization here. Uh, let's just, let's now, um, try and clean things up a bit. The first thing I'm going to suggest that we do is that we uh, we organize our cores uh, so, so that we we organize our cores so we figure out whether we want to have mixed cores or infantry cores or armored cores etc. Uh, what we want to do is we want to take, we, we know that we have two fronts. Uh, let's start with the Polish front. So we'll just select the Polish front unit so that we're not seeing all this stuff down here. And uh, let's start by getting a sense of where these armies are. So we have the second army, which is down here, and the third army, which is up there. So we definitely want to be attaching any cores that are in this northern part to that army. So let's open this interface here. That one's good. That one's good. That one, that one should be attached to the third army. Everything else looks good. Yeah, everything else looks good. Obviously, the theater, the uh, theater HQ is, is kind of awkwardly placed, but you can see that if you look at the blue lines, we can see that all of the cores attached to that army are kind of in the same in the same area. And and if we go down to the second army, oh, we've got something up here. Yeah, we've got something up here. This one here should be attached to the closer army, so we can use that interface there. There we go. Take a look at this Polish front again. Second army looking good. Third army uh, looking good. Obviously, the, uh, the the green line here is just because the theater HQ is up there. But all the blue lines are in the same are in the same region. Now let's take a look at the actual composition of these cores. Uh, I'm just going to open them like this. We can see that we've got some mixed cores here, and this is probably not the best idea. We probably want to concentrate our armor on this front. So let's just open this up here. Uh, let's let's start by uh, taking the infantry out of this core, and we'll make an armored core. We may want to have one armored core for this whole front. I'm going to ignore these uh, these um, cavalry units. I would probably upgrade them or do something else with them, but I'm not going to worry about that for now. So we'll just take we'll take out these these infantry divisions from that core. This one. We'll figure out what core is closest to it. So we don't have a we don't have another infantry corps here, but maybe we'll do, we'll just uh, reallocate this one. So why don't we just detach this from the hierarchy from now for now, and you can keep some 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 ones there that you can just sort of sort out later. One of these is out of range. Uh, we'll attach this. Let's let's to make the job easier. One thing we can do is we can name these these armored corps. So why don't we just call this first armored core that's the naming scheme i use you can use whatever scheme scheme you want i like to i don't typically name my infantry cores i typically name my uh, my armored cores and then we can name this second armored core and my idea for this front would be to have one armored core in each of the two armies so this one is out of range we'll attach it to the other armored core there we go now these cores are, are not completely full, but we could attach more armor to them later. So now this is starting to make a lot more sense. Uh, each one of these, each one of these armies has a few infantry cores and an armored core, so it's kind of a mixed army. That would be a reasonably effective uh, approach for this front. We've also got a, a spare division here that we'll figure out something to do with. Uh, we could create another core for it now, but it might be a little bit wasteful. We're probably going to want to move it somewhere else in the map. So I'd say that the Polish front is looking pretty good. Let's double check. I don't see any red lines. Everything seems to be roughly in the same area. All the, all the blue lines are close together. That's what you're mostly looking for at this stage. Let's take a look at the Ukrainian front. It's going to be a little bit bigger. We've got three armies on the Ukrainian front. So we've got the fourth army, the fifth army, 
And this sixth army is kind of almost a reserve army. It, a lot of the, the divisions that are just kind of not on the front are attached to it. Uh, these armies are, are looking pretty good in terms of what cores are attached to them. Uh, this one is a little bit of a mess, but this army seems to cover the is sort of covering the the entire front line. So we might want to move around some some cores between the, the fourth army and the fifth army. Uh, some of these cores back here, maybe we can attach them to the uh, s the sixth army. Kind of have them be reserve cores. And then maybe we can take this core and attach it to the 5th army so that it's a little bit closer. This one could also be attached to the 5th army. Right, so the 5th army is kind of covering this, this section of the front along, this, along the border with uh, Romania. The 4th army is covering this, this sort of southern Polish front. And the 6th army is, is just kind of a hodgepodge of reserve units that we'll probably want to distribute along the front at, at some point, but that might be useful in the reserve. Uh, let's now do, we're going to hit collapse all just to clean things up, open up the Ukrainian front again. Let's now look at these cores and see, see, uh, see what they look like. Uh, for this front, it's probably not a bad idea to, to use our armor in kind of massed cores. Uh, so we're going to, I would take the whole front, select it all. And now what we can do actually is just take these units here, just take, uh, pick out five uh, armored units, one, two, three, if we even have five here, which I think we probably do, three, four, five, we only have five, okay, oh, we have six, okay. Uh, we'll take these this first three here. We're going to we're going to detach them from all of the unit hierarchy when you have multiple units selected. We're going to create a new core and we're going to call this the fourth uh, third armored core. Uh, now, obviously, uh, it's not attached to an army right now. We'll probably just leave it like that for now. Let's go back to the uh, let's go back to the uh, Ukrainian front. Select everything again. There should be no armored units. Uh, there should only be three armored units now attached to this to this front. We'll detach them from the hierarchy and create the fourth armored core. Now we're going to want to distribute these two armored cores. Uh, we can see that some of the units are out of range, but I'm not going to worry too much about that. Uh, we're going to want to distribute these armored cores to uh, the armies. So we know that the fourth army is covering this part of the front, the fifth army is covering that part of the front. Each one of those should have an armored core for sure. We'll attach that one to the, to the fourth. The fifth doesn't have any space, so we'll take off one of these and attach it to can probably attach one of these cores, maybe this core here, we can attach to the 4th army. There we go. And then we'll take that armored core down here and attach it to the 5th army. There we go. So once again, we now we have these armies that have four infantry cores and one army core. Let's just take a look at these cores and see they're not all completely full. We do have some reserve units that we might be able to distribute though. Well, that was the uh, that was the most challenging part. Uh, these these two fronts uh, on the western front, so it's starting to starting to look better. Uh, now Stavka has two divisions that are attached there. We might want to find a core here to attach them to. Yeah, there we go. So let's take these two divisions here and attach them to that core. Just deal with our spare divisions basically. And there was one other one that I had here. Let's just attach this to the closest core that's not an armored core. It's a little bit far, but we'll sort that out after. Right, so now we're going to want to move our units into position. Uh, we're, well, let's, let's do our leaders first. So uh, we only, we have a few army army groups. Let's uh, open up these and just, just find the army groups. And and for army groups, we do we want to actually show all of our leaders. So we'll, we'll reselect all of these in the filters. And we want to use the highest skilled leaders, not necessarily logistics wizards, but the highest skilled leaders for the army groups that have the, the most uh, uni units attached to them. This is a peacetime order of battle. You may wish to reorganize these, these leaders uh, during wartime to put the most effective leaders uh, in the most effective places. For the time being, I, I'm, I'm going to do a whole video on, on how to use leaders and traits. For the time being, I'm just showing you how to, pos how to place leaders based on reducing supply consumption. So we want the highest level leaders, level five leaders for both the Polish front and the Ukrainian front. Uh, for, the, for the far eastern fronts, we'll, we'll take a skill four guy here. And for the 
Leningrad front will take another skill 4 guy. Doesn't matter what traits they have, they just need to have high score so that they get that uh, that good, uh, that high high skill so that they get that uh, supply consumption reduction. And probably worthwhile doing uh, some army leaders at this point. So let's, uh, let's focus on the Polish front and the Ukrainian front first. And we will open this up and now we're going to go back to viewing logistics wizards leaders only. And we're going to want to take our highest skilled logistic wizards uh, leaders, and we're going to we're going to put them at the army level. If you do have an armored army, then uh, prioritize the armored armies because they consume more supplies and fuel than uh, than uh, than any of the other ones. Right, and and so now uh, we we only have a few logistics wizards guys left, so we're going to want to prioritize. We're going to want to prioritize our armored cores. Because the armor armor uh, armor uses more supply, right? And at this point, what I would do is I would actually go over to the uh, I would go over to the far eastern theater where I know there's a lot of regular units, and I would use I would attach oh there's armies here. Yeah, I can attach these level one guys to these armies, and I think we have a couple cores as well. Yeah. So make sure that your regular units get uh, logistics wizards because your regular units also uh, consume more supplies. We have we have a few leftover. We have a few leftover guys. Uh, I I would probably just go over to Stavka here and uh, just grab a couple random cores and give them logistics wizards leaders. Uh, you will be getting new leaders on the first of January of every year. So uh, I would actually keep my order battle like this. There's no need to assign all the leaders in peacetime. I would only assign them before the war starts because you get new leaders every year. So wait until January 1st, maybe 1939 for the Soviet Union to assign all your leaders. And every January 1st, if you find your, your new logistics wizards leaders and assign them to cores. Uh, other other um, other countries will have enough leaders to have logistics wizard uh, um, leaders at all levels of, of the hierarchy, uh, except for the division level. So so that would be a good approach. We can also take our um, we can also take our our aircraft and assign them to fronts. Uh, I would tend to so this you can see here that the. Uh, this fleet here is actually attached to Stavka. My tendency would be to take the Stalingrad HQ and extend it. And I would maybe include the Crimea in the Stalingrad HQ. And then I would attach this fleet directly to the Stalingrad HQ. Um, that would be my preference. I would not particularly want to have a fleet attached to my main land front. But that's up to you. The Leningrad HQ, I think I attached the... I can attach that. This one has to be attached to the theater because it's way up here. It's not close enough to the Leningrad front. The Leningrad front I already attached the Red Banner Baltic Fleet to. Uh, we can also attach the Air Force to the Leningrad front. So that this, this theater is pretty much done now. Uh, the Far Eastern Theater also has a fleet. Uh, I could probably, if I wanted to have a Pacific fleet, I could attach it to the Far Eastern Front because the Far Eastern Front is based in Vladivostok. Same thing with this. Uh, these, this Air Force unit is way too far. I would probably move it. There's no need to have bombers up there. Uh, this one I can attach to the Far Eastern Front as well. I'm not going to reorganize the Air Force right now. If you are going to use the strategy where you send everything to your capital, you can send your entire Air Force to the capital to reduce supply consumption, reorganize it, and then redistribute it. That's very easy to do. And the same goes for ships. I would I would actually, as the Soviet Union, I would tend to take all these ships, send them all to Leningrad so that they're as close to the capital as possible, reorganize them, and if I want to dispatch fleets out to the Pacific later, I'll do it later. Or I will build new fleets and, and uh, deploy them from, from the pr production interface. My my strategy with the Soviet Union is to actually not le not have anything on the Eastern Front and then to build a whole army from scratch for the Eastern Front around 1941 or 1940, well, 1940, 1941, let's say. Anyway, uh, so our order battles is, is pretty much done at this point. There are a handful of divisions that are out of range. Uh, so let's, let's uh, now just move everything into position uh, using strategic redeployments. The, uh, this Polish front, I am going to move to this, uh, let's move it to Smolensk, why not? The Ukrainian front, I'm going to move to, uh, I'm going to move it maybe to Kiev. Okay, 
And now uh, I'm going to focus on uh, the armies, and I'm actually going to select the um, I'm actually going to select the entire army probably. Second army, third army. Let's just reorganize these. There we go. That was a little bit visually easier to see. I can just put that one on the bottom. Uh, third army. Uh, I can take the entire third army and I can move it to just just move it to a, a one point here, and that's going to allow you to distribute the units evenly across the front and make sure that all the cores are well positioned. Let's move it actually to this province. Go back up to the Polish front, grab the second army here, and we'll move it to maybe this province. Do the same thing on the uh, on the Ukrainian front. Fourth army, we can move to this province. Fifth army, we'll move to this province. And the 6th army, which is kind of a reserve army, we'll just move to here for now. And we might want to redistribute those units afterwards. Right, so now we've got, now this is a lot, going to be a lot easier to organize. So let's take this 3rd army here. And we'll just take these, uh, these infantry divisions and we'll just spread them along the front. Doesn't matter particularly uh, if they're s s perfectly evenly distributed. We just want to get a, a, a general sense of where we want them. Uh, let's grab this army again. Grab the tenth core. Similar thing here. You'll notice that what I'm doing here is I'm just deselecting units, uh, and you see you end up with something like that. So that's a useful way to do things. There is another infantry corps. This infantry corps can cover off maybe this area here. Generally speaking, you want about two divisions along your entire front in peacetime. And we'll leave the armored corps where it is for now. Let's just move it one province out so it's not like sitting on the, ar on the actual army. Now we'll do this army. We only have two cores here. Let's take a look at the infrastructure view because some of these provinces are kind of impassable. Uh, let's take this core here and it can kind of be in charge of this marshy area. Uh, maybe we'll put these two, these three here. And the core like there. Second army. And the 6th core, we'll put kind of along here. If we don't get this perfectly right the first time, we, we'll be able to move units, uh, you know, a few provinces around the front. The armored core, once again, I'm just going to kind of leave in, in back. Now we'll do this front here. I'm not going to touch this army for now. It's kind of a reserve army. I'm just going to distribute these armies along the front. And we'll take the armored core that's attached to this army. Oh, we have another core here. Okay, I'll just send this one down there and we'll redistribute it after. And the armored core will just move like there. And then the fifth army. Uh, when you have a river like this, uh, you probably only need about one division uh, along the front. One or two, maybe have a few spare divisions around. And take this armored core and we'll just move it there for now. Let's unpause and just wait until all those units get roughly into into position. So we can see we've got a few little gaps along the front here. Uh, let's just take a look at the order of battle. It's starting to look more like the kind of order of battle we want to see, right? Um, yeah, so you can see here we've actually got a whole core there. Probably a little bit too much along this front. Uh, at this point, we could start. We could even redistribute uh, some cores to other armies and stuff like that. Yeah, this. So this here, for example, we can probably move these guys there. Take these guys. Sort of move some there. And you know, we can start to just manually move divisions to reposition them along the front here. But it's looking pretty decent.
yeah, it's looking it's looking pretty decent overall. Uh, and so that gives you a sense. I think that gives you a pretty good sense of of how to organize your order of battle. Uh, this this order of battle is obviously we've got this huge reserve army here. Uh, what what you do with this would be it would depend on your strategy. Um, I will be doing a video at some point on like setting up a proper defense in depth strategy. I I would not necessarily advise um, you know putting all of your units on the front line. Um, the reason is because if you get if if they break through the front line, they can encircle large parts of your army. Whereas if you have if you have units uh, behind other barriers, for example, these rivers, I would probably set this army up as a as a reserve army along this river or something. But that's gonna get, that gives you a pretty good sense of that gives you a pretty good sense of how um, how the uh, army is going how the order of battle is going to look when you set things up. You can continue to tweak this. Uh, and you can continue to add those logistics wizards leaders and then when you get closer to wartime uh, you are going to want to uh, reorganize things. Obviously, I would probably, as the Soviet Union, I would probably do things like take the armor up here and move it down and add it to one of these armored cores down here. I would probably also take any armored divisions over here uh, and I would, I, would, I would attach them there. I, I would do things, I would probably take I would probably take any of the um, armor. I might, I might upgrade the cavalry to armor as well. Uh, I, I would start doing things like putting garrisons in ports uh, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but that's kind of another topic. Uh, there's also some armor over here that's not really very useful and stuff. But anyway, this gives you a sense of how to how to reorganize a very complicated and large order of battle it's starting to look it's starting to look like a much tidier order of battle here and I would continue to tweak this it's something that you can do during the opening years of the war continue to tweak your order of battle everything now is in range they're getting good supply bonuses let's take a look here we have we've gone down to 119 regular brigades we were at 175 uh, when we started the campaign so we're saving lots of consumer goods uh, as the Soviet Union, another option is to simply delete all your HQs, move every single unit to the capital, and have no HQs until you're actually getting close to war. And that way your consumer goods consumption will be next to, to nothing. So it's up to you what, what you choose to do. Uh, supplies. We still have a fair, fair amount of needs in terms of supplies, even if I advance the clock here. Uh, so certainly reducing, you know, uh, moving moving some of these some of these spare divisions and stuff away from the front might not be a bad idea that's entirely up to you um, at, at some point though you are gonna have to distribute units along the front and this is more or less what it's gonna look like so I hope you enjoyed this video I hope it's helpful uh, leave a comment if you have any questions hit the like button if you like the video and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more ciao